Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Grays Harbor uh, Fisheries Discussion for 2023. I'm just going to give us a minute or two here so we make sure that we, we have everybody uh, here who wants to be. Okay, I, I think we're leveling off on our participant numbers. So I'll go ahead and get started here by just uh, reviewing our Zoom meeting roles. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, uh, uh, some call logistics and ground roles here. You can turn your camera on and mute or unmute yourself through the control panel at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna keep folks muted during the beginning of our program and then we'll unmute you and we open it up for questions and feedback. Callers can unmute themselves by pressing star six on their phones. We ask that you raise your hand to ask a question and you can access that through the control panel at the bottom of the screen. You can also raise your hand by hovering over your face or name on the list of participants and callers can raise their hand by dialing star nine. Uh, please be respectful of others, mute your phone or line and listen to others when they're speaking. Be tough on the issues and questions, but not on people or organizations. Please don't make any personal attacks, insults, or threats. Speak and act professionally and, and allow for a balance of speaking time so everybody has a chance um, on the microphone. If you have any technical issues during the call, you can use the chat button and we'll help you through those. But please don't use the chat for questions or comments because uh, during the presentation because we're going to take those live at the end. Um, so welcome everybody. My name is Marlene Wagner. Uh, we're here this evening as part of our 2023 North of Falcon process and we're focusing tonight on Grace Harbor. There's some handouts for tonight's meeting posted on our website and we'll reference those as, as we move along this evening. Um, our presentation overview uh, and meeting agenda, we're going to first introduce our staff involved with North of Falcon in the Grace Harbor region. Then we'll briefly review the North of Falcon process and the event calendar. Uh, we'll have a look at this year's proposed ocean quotas, revisit the Grace Harbor salmon forecasts, and then we'll talk about our management objectives and fisheries planning uh, for the upcoming season. And finally, uh, we'll present some modeled fisheries, fisheries scenarios. Um, so here we have the staff organization chart for Grace Harbor. Again, my name is Marlene Wagner. I am the South Coast Policy Lead covering Wallapa Bay and Grace Harbor. Uh, I work with the state statewide salmon management team under Mark Baltzell at Washington's statewide salmon and steelhead manager and Kyle Attix, our intergovernmental salmon manager. Uh, Barb McClellan has also joined our team this year as the Wallapa and Grace Harbor commercial and marine recreational biologist. Over in Region 6, James Losey is our Regional Fish Program Manager. Mike Scharf is the Grays Harbor District Fish Biologist. And Kim Figler-Barnes and Kurt Holt are the Grays, area, uh, Grays Harbor Area Biologists. Um, so what is North of Falcon? Uh, North of Falcon is the annual cooperative process to set salmon seasons in Washington waters. The name refers to waters north of Oregon's Cape Falcon which marks the southern border of Washington's management of salmon stocks. So in North Falcon, it's just one component of a larger salmon setting process that also involves the state, tribal governments, federal regulators, other United States, and Canada. What guides North Falcon? At North Falcon is an ongoing process where fishery managers weigh many factors when developing salmon seasons that include uh, Endangered Species Act constraints, Commissioner's policy, Pacific Salmon Treaty obligations, uh, and we do this with our tribal co-managers as Washington's treaty tribes manage their own fisheries, sharing data and agreeing to harvest plans. 
And all of this involves the extensive monitoring and evaluation of fisheries that happen in the region and statewide. So here we have the, the remaining schedule of regional meetings for 2023 North of Falcon season. Here we are tonight, March 22nd, to go over the forecasts and open a discussion about Grace Harbor fisheries. On the 29th, we'll have a second North of Falcon meeting where we meet with co-managers and hone in on fisheries planning models. We're gonna get together with you again on March 30th to continue to discuss preferred fishery options for 2023. Uh, before the final Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting. On April, uh, April 12th, uh, we'll have another public meeting um, to present the final fisheries packages for both Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor. So you, you can follow any of the links for individual meetings listed on this page. And uh, if you follow the link that is at the bottom of the page, you can see the entire statewide schedule and you'll, you'll find materials for every meeting that's been held so far. And you can also uh, review recordings of those meetings if you uh, uh, participated and want to see them again, or if you missed one and, and you wanna check it out. And so here are uh, this year's proposed non-treaty ocean quotas. So earlier this month, the Pacific Fishery Management Council set ocean alternatives for 2023. They're listed in this table for both Chinook and Coho. Um, and for Chinook, the quotas are mostly driven by Columbia River stocks. Up river stocks have significant increases this year. Um, almost all of Chinook fishing is closed in south of Falcon though. So there's an increase in ocean fisheries, but we do have an impact rate cap of 38% on lower Columbia River tules. Uh, Coho forecasts are, are similar this year. Uh, as uh, uh, to last year, but they are down slightly. So the, these quota options here reflect that. Next slide, please. Uh, and so, so here's some ocean quota or ocean quotas from 2010 to present day. So it's just a graphical dis depiction of the marine area ocean quotas um, from 2010 to 2022. The black lines on top represent non-treaty quotas. And the gray lines represent treaty quotas across all those years. So you can see Chinook on the left and Coho on the right. And really the message here is that we must account for both state and tribal ocean fisheries when determining terminal run fisheries. And with that, I will pass the microphone off to Mike Sharp, the Grace Harbor District Fish Biologist. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me just fine? I'm taking it that that's a yes. I can hear you, Mike. Okay. Um, we're going to go over the forecasts again this year um, in this meeting. We, we covered those earlier uh, a couple of weeks back, but we'll hit them again. Um, we have a spring Chinook forecast that's a little bit under the goal, uh, whereas we have a fall Chinook forecast that's just a little bit over the goal. And then uh, an abundant forecast for coho, both in the natural origin and the hatchery origin uh, stocks. So that kind of tells us where we would probably be concentrating our efforts this year. Next slide. Um, we're gonna go over just a, a few of these graphs that we showed earlier. It, it just shows the most recent trend uh, of our escapement and, and run size um, of our stocks. And here we have our spring Chinook. Um, the dark line, the black line is escapement, whereas the gray line is a uh, run size. It, in the most recent years, we really haven't had any uh, fisheries on the stock. So the gray and the black lines overlap. That's why you only see one, one line there. And then the blue uh, dot is the predicted uh, forecasted uh, return. Next. Uh, here are Shayla's Fall Chinook, uh, same. Same uh, lines and colors there uh, with a forecast that's a little bit above the goal, not a lot, but um, at, at least we're above the goal. Uh, next. And then our coho, we see that the crash in 2015 and then uh, most recent years, we've, we've seen a rebound. The 2022 uh, escapement estimate is not complete at this time, but uh, pretty safe to say that it was at least, if not larger than the 2021, 
based on um, REDS that we uh, enumerated this year in our survey work. Next. The Hump Tulips and Grace Harbor Chum forecasts uh, for Fall Chinook, we have similar uh, forecasts for natural and hatchery fish, a little bit above the goal. Uh, coho, uh, natural coho are still below the goal before they even cross the bar, but we have a fairly robust hatchery forecast for coho. And again, just for refreshers, the coho forecasts are an ocean age three uh, number, which basically is uh, the number of fish, adult fish out in the ocean before we put fisheries together. So these numbers uh, in terms of fish crossing the bar will be a little bit lower uh, when we get the final ocean package put together. Next. So quick, quick uh, review of, of the trends in hump tulips. This is the fall Chinook. You see a fairly stable population over time. Um, and a forecast that is a little bit above the, the goal. For a hump tulips coho, again, you can see even in this, this population that's pretty small, the crash in 2015, and then we're starting to see a kind of an increase in numbers. Uh, I will, will bite my tongue. Well, no, I won't. I will say that I think that the 2022 escapement may actually be above the goal for the first time in a number of years, but final has not been um, finished yet. Next. Uh, the chum, uh, again, black line is escapement, gray line is uh, run size, um, and pretty stable population here, um, fairly robust and uh, as we've moved through time. Uh, I'm going to hit on just the Queets and the Quinault coho forecasts. Again, these are the ocean age three abundances. Uh, key here is that uh, they are uh, abundances that will provide us opportunity to provide some sort of fishery on them. And, and their trends over time. Next. Uh, here are the uh, Quinault coho numbers kind of a steady increase since the 2010. Um, at this point, we don't have an escapement goal, but you know we, we've got 30,000 fish coming back fairly routinely. Next, Queens Coho, again, you can see the crash in 2015, but kind of an increase in abundance in the last few years. 2022 is a preliminary number that probably will change as more data are collected and analyzed and scrubbed and cleaned up. So, um, but we have a forecast that is um, at a spot where we, we can provide opportunity. Next. So now that we know what the forecasts are, we get an idea of, of what stocks are abundant. What do we get to do? Um, our spring Chinook population or forecast was a little below goal this year. Probably aren't going to put anything together that will will target that stock. <clears throat> We've got our Chinook populations, our Chum and our Chehalis Coho that are all in um, the policy guidance of achieving the escapement goal. Um, and up to lips Coho, uh, we will cap our impacts during WDFW fisheries to 5% or less uh, based on not achieving the goal three out of the last five years. And also the forecast is below the escapement goal. So next. So there are a couple of things I wanna bring up as fishery suggestions that are kind of a little bit outside of uh, what we usually talk about. These are conservation and orderly fishery management proposals. Uh, there have been some complaints about some uh, disorderly fishery out in the Westport Boat Basin. And so we're going to propose to restrict the use of uh, jigs, basically anything that has weight molded to the hook uh, from, from use. So twitching jigs, swim jigs, casting jigs. Um, within the boat basin during that period of time when, when coho and uh, are open for retention. 
Uh, the another one is Satsup River and the Wainuchi River, a Chinook conservation measure in the month of August and September. Uh, we propose to put in place a selective gear rule during those two months. Uh, the goal here is to uh, reduce encounters with uh, Chinook during that period of time when salmon fishery is not open. Um, and, you know, we've had, uh, this is just a measure to provide a little more uh, protection for our Chinook. And then the third, uh, there was some conversation in the last meeting about um, the jack fishery in the lower Chehalis River in August and September, um, some concern about uh, hooking mortality to adult fish. Uh, in, in our conversations that I've had internally and, and with enforcement, uh, we feel that the best way to move forward right now is to do in-season monitoring, particularly tracking um, environmental conditions. Uh, it seems like the experienced people thought that this was um, exas the, the problem was exasperated uh, by the really low flows that we had this year, this last fall, and, and that if we are seeing similar conditions in August and September, then we would implement a selective gear rule from the mouth, so Highway 101 up to South Elma Bridge, and then keep that rule in place until we see that rainfall, uh, which is substantial enough to get those fish to move up upriver. So th those are the kind of the three little things that were kind of sidebarred to, to some of the other modeling. Um, these aren't things that we can model savings really for, but things that we would like or you know, proposals we want to implement. So as we move forward in this meeting, um, I, I've created some, some modeling scenarios um, to see uh, exactly where we sit. So one of the models that I put together was last year's fishery schedule with this year's uh, forecasted abundance to see where we fit um, within the, the guidelines of the policy and, and do it, does last year's season fit into the, the management um, that we have to do this year. So, um, and then I produced two other options. One, one was a simple look at how do I take those red boxes and turn them green and then uh, I did another quick one that showed some extra opportunity for coho. And, and so I'm gonna, in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna be kind of bouncing back and forth to show you um, some of the old spreadsheets that we used to share and, um, and continue to talk about this. And, and then as we move forward, um, part of this meeting is to take some, um, suggestions from the public. Uh, so that's the gather the input. And, and as we move forward, uh, next week is our North Falcon meeting with the co-managers where we might start getting an idea of what the co-managers might be doing. And, and that will dictate whether or not the options that we provide will fit together with their schedules. And then we will continue to do the evaluations. And then next Thursday, We'll have a review meeting with with you guys, and then we go down to California to PFMC to finalize things. So, with that said, um, if I could share screen real quick, um, okay, wait, yep, share. Hopefully, it's the screen. This is strange. Go ahead, share my screen. Share. Let me know if you can see it yet. We can see it, Mike. Okay, is it going up and down? Yep. Okay, so what this is, is last year's season with this year's abundance and with some tweaking to the model to include some of the data that we collected in 2021 and and some updates. And, and so some of the things that, and I'm going to show the three of them, the three models I put together. So one of the things I want to show, can everybody see this fine? 
I can make it bigger if we need to make it bigger. I'll just make it bigger. I think it looks fine on my end. Okay. So um, here's the forecasted abundance across the top. Uh, goals. And what share we have of what was above the goal. So for the Shailish Natural Chinook, we have 538 fish that we could go after. And, and the model from last year shows this green number here. Just, just want to get this out there real quick so everybody understands some of these numbers. And so some of the management objectives, keep our share where it needs to be. Are we going to make the escapement goal? Not here for Shayla Chinook, but we're under our goal or our share. So this, um, we will need help with the commander jobs on this one. Um, the other red box, this is the proportion of the non-treaty commercial in 2A, 2D that, um, that impacts that, that occur on uh, natural Chinook, Shea's natural Chinook. It's gotta be 0.8% or less. And we see this, this box is red. So last year's commercial season does not fit this part of the policy. And if you go down to the hump tulips, here's our goal. Last year's season puts us over on natural Chinook and hump tulips. So we're catching more than our goal and we're under the escapement goal. And for natural Chinook or coho, we're under the escapement goal, but the policy says if we're in that zone where we're in, or limiting our impacts to 5% or less, that's what we need to do. So here's 3.46%. For all of WDFW managed fisheries. So even though we're not making the goal here, we're achieving the conservation objective through three, three point four six. So can we go back to the uh, presentation? Okay. Let's drop down one slide. So here, here is in under 2022, that is last year's season kind of summed up. It's, you can't see it really well, but we know that there are some red boxes within this um, fishery package. So to make all of the boxes green, uh, it, it wasn't that difficult. First off, I had to do something with the commercial side of things to get that 0.9 down below uh, 0.8. Uh, and, and some of the conversations I've had with the, the, the commercial industry, they're more willing to use a, a tangle net. Uh, and so simply taking week 43, the two days that were fished there, turn them into tangle nets, made that... Uh, adjustment meet the uh, policy guidance. And for the hump tulips, because we were over the share of natural Chinook, uh, simply going mark selective for Chinook in, in marine area two, so the North Bay, and going full season mark selective for Chinook in hump tulips. And that's what this red here is. That turned that box green. So if I can take screen sharing again. Hopefully it did it right. So here's model A. Here's the Chehalis Natural Chinook. We're still below the goal there, but we're within our share. And then the commercial going mark uh, tangle net in week 43, put that down to 0.78% of the in, uh, impacts on Chehalis wild fish. And in hump tulips, we had a share of, of 303 with going mark selective 
it dropped that down so that now we are under the share that uh, we we have. Still not making the goal there, but we're still under the um, three point uh, under the five percent on Hump Tulips Natural Chinook. Or sorry, Coho. Keep jumping around. Um, and one of the other things that I need to bring up, it was brought up in the last meeting. Some people are a little concerned. If we drop down into the Shahala or the Grace Harbor total, and, and remember the Quinaults managed to a Grace Harbor aggregate for Chinook and Coho, that even with us being within our shares, the Grace Harbor escapement is not being met through these changes. And I, I will rem remind everybody that the escapement goal was done when it used a lot of the data that were pre 100% uh, marking of Chinook. So it was a, a, a spawner recruit analysis that used fish that put eggs in the gravel and, and the adult uh, recruits that it produced so this is a natural spawning goal. So this is the expected escapement of hatchery Chinook. And some of those are going to go to the hatchery. But we, we've evaluated over the years how many of the escapement of hatchery fish actually make it to the spawning grounds. And it's about 61% annually and it doesn't vary that much it's pretty steady so 61 percent of these will go into the spawning escapement of the natural population but that's not going to achieve this here so something else is going to need to be tweaked um, but you'll see this red box in all three of the models it's something that we wouldn't be able to do on our own to get those that box to turn red. So again, the boxes we needed to turn green was uh, uh, um, Hump Tulip Natural Chinook, um, non-treated commercial fishery impacts on Shehalis Chinook, and, and those were the only two red ones that we had to deal with. So if we go back to the um, back to the presentation, and then the third model that I put together after looking at the two, um, I decided, hey, we we have some more opportunity for coho. What could we do with coho? So um, I went back to kind of standard regulations in the bay. You know, I had to keep the, the mark selective in hump tulips. That, that's got to stay mark selective in North Bay. But in the East Bay, let's just go two fish for the whole season. In Chehalis, lower Chehalis, let's go two fish through November. And then in December, we'll go to one fish and, and release Chinook. That, that's always going to be there. And then in the tributaries, you know, October, November, go to two fish. Then in December, go to one fish. So what does that look like? Does that meet the, um, the objective? So if you could switch it back over, this will be the last time I get to do that. Bummer for you guys, right? Okay, so this is model B. We still stay under our goal. We're still achieving the escapement on, on coho. Our, our um, commercial guys are still within their um, situation. Um, we're staying under our goal or our share in uh, Hump Tulip Chinook. We're still within our 5% um, on Hump Tulips Coho. Um, and so throwing the, these, giving, adding these, these extra fish later in the season still meets the management objectives. And, and I think there's one other one that I know might come up uh, and that's from Francis. What is the portion of the Hump Tulips Coho or no Chinook 
being impacted by the commercial fishery. And, and there's limitations there. So in this model, it's not even close to meeting that threshold. It's point, I think it's 1.2% of the pump tulips natural stock and, and we're less than a half a percent. So I don't know why that's not green, but that's there. Okay, so that's all I have to share. These will be out and available uh, tomorrow. I think we're going to get them PDF'd and thrown out there. Um, if we can go back to the presentation. And, and just so you know, the red on, on uh, as these goes through, the red is just indicating a change from 2022. So on the next slide, uh, some of this is familiar. So it just kind of shows uh, some of the selective differences between the two. I will say that going to a tangle net in um, the commercial fishery, we do not have a means to scale the difference between um, a regular gill net and a tangle net in terms of catchability. So you'll see that there's no change in the number because we didn't change the number of days fished. We just changed some of the gear there. So we, we don't have the ability to, to model that difference. And so on the Shehala side, we really didn't do anything different except go to, to a tangle net for model B. So there isn't any change in those numbers, but you can see that if we give you two fish through November, it increases the number of coho being harvested in the commercial or the sport fisheries. But in the Shehala side, um, you can see that if we go mark selective, we, we save a bunch of fish. Um, and, and just quickly looking at the chum picture, um, not a lot of chum that are encountered. Uh, some people, uh, it's an important fishery, but um, uh, it, it's almost an afterthought to coho. But th that gives you just kind of a, a comparison look to, to the three different models. I think I am done. So um, as I presented this again, this this is just what the staff thought that we could do with, with the abundance that we had and, and the guidance from the policy. Um, we, we looked at some of the suggestions that we've received so far. Um, really the only one that was out there was kind of how do we address the uh, jack fishery and the impacts to adult uh, Chinook. Um, there have been a couple other suggestions. Um, difficult to model in terms of changes in impacts, but you know regulations that could be implemented. So uh, certainly uh, with that said, uh, part of this meeting is to uh, listen to you guys to tell us what you think is important for us to put together for fisheries this fall. So with that said, I think I, I will leave it for questions. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, our first hand is from Francis. Francis, go ahead. Unmuting. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, first off, thank you, Mike. That was a lot of legwork, very well done on your presentation. Um, I would uh, be the first one to say that I would uh, fully endorse Model B. It's all the boxes um, as far as our obligations on the state side. We're still, we're still falling short on coho, wild coho on the hump tulips. That's, that's no surprise. I think, um, there's there, there's got to be some issues of where we're sampling and seeing those uh, as someone who has fished that um, coho fishery a lot. I mean, I, I, I just I scratch my head that we can't make coho escapement when I see the volume of wild coho that we encounter. Not just the volume the actual proportion of wild coho to hatchery coho on some of those days, we are sorting through a lot of fish. So I would just encourage the, 
the agency to maybe have a look at, you know, look with the tribe. Are we, are we surveying the right indexes to really know that we're capturing the true amount of wild coho escaping into that system and actually putting eggs into the gravel? Okay, so I'll leave that there. Um, happy to see that uh, we got the, um, uh, the 0.8% in the commercial fishery in line, because that was one of the things I uh, was concerned about along with Dave Hamilton. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's a lot of things on Chinook conservation that it sounds like we just can't model. Is, is that correct, Mike? Um, yes, on, some of it's really rules. And you know, I brought up I brought up the proposal from uh, another uh, person from the public about no bobbers. I don't know how much um, uh, you guys have had a chance to kind of ruminate over that, but. You know, there's there's ways to to conduct that jack fishery where it truly is a jack fishery, uh -huh. um, and uh, I think the selective gear rules make sense. I'm not sure how selective gear and no bobbers meshes. I'm not I'm not a hundred percent up on the language for the selective gear rule. I mean, a bobber a bobber and eggs would be legal. Excuse me, a, a bobber and eggs would not be legal. Correct debate <clears throat> in the tribs. I think it makes a lot of sense. In the main stem Chehalis, I think the the idea of giving one you know a, a, a user group that's really targeting the jacks the ability to use bait, you know, in a way that doesn't jeopardize their fishery and you know is it, they're targeting a fish that that isn't really even being it, it's not part of our obligation in terms of meeting a conservation objective on jacks. So I, I, I kind of like preserving that. Uh, I, I would love to hear from the rest of the public about uh, their concerns on, on banning the, the, the bobber. Uh, because if you take away the bobber, you also take away bobber and jig. And I don't know how many guys are using that technique. I'd say probably more guys who are really targeting coho which is the fish of abundance, which we want to get, are, are, are twitching jigs, not, not, not the more passive, you know, let, let, a, let a jig under, hang underneath a bobber kind of deal. So uh, looking forward to see if there's any other uh, public comment, either pro or, or con on that uh, anti-bobber rule for six weeks in the main stem shaders. Okay, and with that, I'll yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And our next hand is from Eric. Eric, go ahead. Hi, can Hi. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, thanks for taking my time here to talk. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, you referenced the Satsip and Wainucci going to selective gear only in August and September. Uh, my question is, the Wainucci in particular, would that be the entire river? And then I have one more question after that. So um, the intent there would be to protect Chinook and, and based on uh, discussions, it seems like it would be probably just from White Bridge down. Okay, uh, if I could, it would take me 30 seconds here. I'd like to offer a proposal uh, with a slight change. Sure. Um, I would suggest um, your selective gear rule from Black Creek down uh, at least August, um, and then keep the rest of the river as is current regs with single barbless after August 16th to November 30th, and then no bait above White Bridge after September 16th. And I know you were talking from White Bridge down. Um, guys, I've, it's a robust summer steelhead fishery that time of year. Um, I've fished that run for going on 35 years now. And, the, you know, Black Creek up, uh, particularly crossover up in August, those Chinook just aren't there. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of a kind of a, a waste, not a wasted rule, so to speak. To it, it seems a little overzealous to me. Just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you for the comment, and, and certainly we've got it jotted down, and we'll evaluate it. Thanks. 
And our next hand is from David. David, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, got several items. Uh, the bridges, when I brought that up a while back and I've done it before is the idea for selective gear would be above white bridge or the sats of nursery bridges below. I don't care how you fish the Chinook don't really hang out there too much. They kind of stop move. The main problem on the sats of rivers towards Schaefer Park, but it's definitely even with low flows above the railroad bridge and the Nooch and the Satsup Nursery Bridge on the Satsup, okay? That's one. You don't need to shut the bottom down because they don't really hang out that hard down there. And once people start throwing gear around, they have to use anyway. Uh, on the jacks, the problem is not tide water or lower tide water or uh, what's known as skinny water as you go up above South Monty. The problem we're hitting with jacks that everybody's jumping about is at Fuller Hill. And that's because the, tennis, the Chinook have a tendency when they reach that cool, cooler water at the Satsup, they like to hang out and park. It's more like catching their breath. And I, anybody, I, I don't hang out there anymore, but uh, it is a problem and we know that, but you shouldn't take out the whole jack fishery because you have a problem mainly driven by guides at Fuller Hill, okay? So I realize that's a problem. In your recommendations, you were going for October 1st above Fuller Hill. That I can tell you, I disagree with extremely because I broodstocked above there and I know how those fish move. And uh, uh, they, they're gonna hold up. They're, they're not, you're not gonna really get any Chinook above Porter of any number and any coho until latter part of October. And that depends on it rains, unless you get crazy years like last year where the whole mob stampedes and you, that's an outlier. You can't do nothing about that. But uh, uh, the, the problem above, above Fuller Hill, uh, I back up to the 15th because brood stocking, we were losing hens. Bucks would get, get through perfectly. We handled them right, not a mark on them, but the hens are in warm water in massive egg development and you just wind their clock down and they simply won't come back up. They will just expire. They just run out of gas. And so I would go for October 15th with an address right after it says, if we get flows or fish movement, We'll immediately open it up to the, you know, like uh, we would have October 1st. That way you get maximum opportunity, maximum protection for the fish, and you are not losing, on average, that much wreck opportunity. Unless, like I say, the fish move or you get early rain, then you open it up. But that two week window, you're playing with fire. Okay. And on the, on the, on the part of this, the schedule we're looking at, um, and everything you got. Uh, Mike, has have, have the Quinn given you any idea of what their, this year's schedule will look like at all? No, not not yet. We we hope to have that exchanged uh, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, uh, next week. Okay, so that means <laughs> direct impact. You're trying to lock out right out. Uh, the one the model showed, uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.9 for the commercial that may or may not hold true because if the nation has to move their days, there's going to end up being a conflict between the non-treaty commercial dates and probably the tribal nets. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, yeah, certainly th this is our, our first look at what we think we could do. Uh, certainly going to depend on uh, the, the Penalts and WDFW getting together and, and coordinating our season structure within the Bay. Okay, and uh, I, I like the uh, uh, second Francis' thoughts on uh, thanking you for putting this together. Um, I think it did very good and I appreciate you putting the model up. I realize it looks scrambled for you, but uh, the understanding what those red boxes people have learned when you guys send them all out, 
they can't tell this or that and they can look at dates and they know the different models are going to change. The one thing they know they can always go look at is that summary trap where you've got them where they turn red, green or whatever and people can see what works. And that is very helpful to everybody, I think, and it's appreciated. So I guess I'll shut up after that and wait and see what everybody else has to say. But um, uh, the one thing about this is I wish someday the agency would say, and I realize you're terminal, is we are worried about Chinook and not having seen the model, but I think it'll look like last year. They're going to kill more of our Chinook in BC and Alaska than cross our barn. And so you're going to hear out of staff and many others the need for conservation. Well, after doing 20 years of conservation and rebuilding runs, I'm very much in that line, except all you do when you take it out on us, the terminal fisher, Quinn, whoever it is, is you enable the other people who are doing the damage in the ocean. It's no different than a damn druggie. And as long as we keep sitting here and not saying nothing and yell conservation and they keep doing that, all you're doing is enabling them. They will never stop until somebody raises hell. And we are getting close to raise hell time in some of our stocks because we are not hatchery driven, we're wild driven. And we are not a glacier stream, where we're a rain fed stream. And all those things combine to really put the bite on us for conservation. And we do, particularly, to be honest, the non-treaty nets do the least damage. The wreck do the next. Commercial, uh, the Quinault take a share. The off, the marine for off Washington coast, charter boats, whatever, they take some, but not that many. It's about Alaska and BC and what's left by the time they get here. And then the need for staff to conserve to make escapement. And I'm telling you, I'm almost to the point where I say to hell with it. If we don't make it, we don't make it. Because as long as you keep doing that, Alaska and BC are gonna flat ass keep on butchering our runs and you just enable them like a damn junkie. And I'll shut up now. Thanks so much, Dave. We really appreciate your input. And yeah, it is frustrating to know that Alaska and Canada get their fair share. Um, just, just so I'm clear, uh, your recommendations or suggestions were uh, Shayless River main stem up around the, the above the Fuller Bridge. Don't open it until October 15th. And and then if we have to concentrate any kind of issue with uh, the jack fishery, uh, primarily that's uh, above the or in the Fuller Hill area. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the, OK, yeah, uh, like there's a. Former gill netter, who's probably listening here, who's the most dangerous man I know with a fishing rod and fishing jacks, he'll, he's like, I ask him point blank, he never lies. How many did you get? He says two. He says two Chinook, broke one off, then I had to turn one loose, fishing for jacks. And that's about what it is there because the fish are either moving at night or moving with the tide in the morning. It's when they slow down about halfway up there and hit the north side of the river where the sats of water is kind of cooler. And then when they get to Fuller Hill, it's just a cooler patch of water and they stop. And that is that and above Fuller Hill is the primary problem Got it. For, for, for survival. It's just, it's pretty simple. It's just, and by the way, right after I say that, I know the fish will absolutely screw me. They'll do just <laughs> something absolutely different. But as a general rule, you start there. Got it. I'm just saying, and like on the, the Sasa, below the bridges, if you have to do something, Wanucci, below the bridges, bank access there and everything else and it works out to where everybody's covered i think we're and, and the fish cool thanks so so we got any more comments questions yeah, sorry about that, Mike. I lost I lost internet for a second. Oh, okay. um, our next hand is from Garrett. Garrett, go ahead. Hey there, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. I want to thank you guys. Uh, thanks, Mike, for putting these uh, models together. Um, I highly uh, Highly support your option B that we've got going. We've got lots of coho. Uh, 
and really no management um, conservation restrictions this year on the on the five percent cap so let's harvest some fish um uh one thing i want to point out on uh that december coho fishery i know uh thank you guys for uh making the effort to give us that december 1st through 16th last year really appreciate it um just kind of wanted to mention on that was we got in that december fishery it was uh, restricted to no fishing from a floating device and from Oakville boat launch down river. And that time of year, um, we're targeting in the upper basin, the Skookum Chuck hatchery run. And that time of year, they're normally staged and holding from Oakville to Borst in Centralia. Um, and that, that stretch of river doesn't really have a whole lot of, uh, public access aside from, uh, aside from having a boat and uh um so if we get a december fishery this year december 1st de december 1st through 16th uh uh assuming that we have uh steelhead issues again um i'd really highly like to suggest we have a uh have fishery from a boat from oakville up to centralia and then uh uh, even if we got to go no bait, single barbless, whatever we got to do as far as steelhead conservation, um, that Oakville to Centralia fishery from a boat uh, is really where we're able to access those hatchery coho. So, uh, but yeah, love option B. Uh, thanks for all you guys are doing. Uh, that's all I got for now. Thank you very much. Our next hand is from Travis. Travis, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hey, Mike. Uh, I want to thank thank you as well for everything you, that you're doing and doing the battle in for us here. You and I have had a lot of conversation outside these meetings. Um, I I would like to second what I believe Garrett was just talking about. Only for that December fishery, um, I'd move it if, if you had to do something with the the boat situation down to Porter because right up into December, I'm still fishing Porter and the, the fishing for hatchery coho is still phenomenal down that low. Um, it's kind of a bummer because he is right. Most of that water is all, you know, uh, private land all around it. And there isn't a lot of access. And then of course we're running into issues with the Chehalis tribe as you and I have spoke about during fishing from Oakville to pray the road being harassed and whatnot which i'm hoping to get some answers on about that um so that 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 situation in itself taking it to a no boat restriction was just a killer for all of us uh, especially during the prime time i would like to you know say I, I am all for option b if we have that many fish available uh, and one thing i want to clarify because I, I i missed it um down on the lower Chehalis, say, you know, at the, from the mouth to Polar Bridge or whatever, when you guys are talking no bait, is this all all for the jack fishery? I kind of missed part of the meeting there. Um, or is this something, you know, because we do a lot of trolling for herring and stuff with herring and stuff down there. That last part of October, is that, would that be affected by that? So, so just for clarification, um, the proposal that we have right now is not to do anything unless we see this um, severe environmental conditions, which creates, uh, as we had last year, near record low uh, flows and uh, you know elevated water temperatures. So um, if we see that and then we see that there's no rain in the near uh, future, um, we, we are going to propose a selective gear rule, which would then uh, not allow bait. So it, it's your standard selective gear rule, figuring that that's the cleanest way to address what we would hope to be maybe a really short time period. Because once we see that rain and things pick up, then if we had to implement that, um, that restriction, uh, we could quickly take it off as soon as we see the water come up. So we, we aren't proposing that it, it, it's going to go in. We're going to evaluate environmental conditions to see if it, it, it would be needed. Okay. Another suggestion, um, 
that I have, and I don't even know if this is a possibility, but if say we have steelhead problems again, and they're looking at shutting us down coho fishing in December, is there any way of doing some sort of in-season management to allow us to target those fish in November that we're going to miss out on in December if we're not fishing? Um, that was a couple of, some people asked me that, well, why can't we go to a three fish limit if we're going to lose December? Uh, for the month of November, something along those lines or some sort of in-season management that way. That way we still are allowed to at least get our fish, even though we're not on the water for that month. So bag limit increases earlier in the season if things aren't looking promising. Yeah. That way we still have the opportunity to get the fish, you know, our hatchery fish or, or whatever the case may be. If you got to change something around where you only get, you know, one wild and two hatcheries, whatever the, however you want to work that, just so we have the opportunity to get the fish if the river is going to be shut down for the month of December. Hey, Travis, uh, James Losey here, regional program manager in region six. Um, I really appreciate the way you're thinking about this. So there's a couple questions around uh, the way the steelhead fisheries are going to shake out. And of course, we're here to talk about salmon, but the things limiting that December fishery, you know, are going to be monitoring effort. So there's money tied to that that's currently in the legislature. So that's uncertain. And then there's, um, of course, steelhead abundance. And I'm, I know you know this, we don't have the forecast for steelhead next year. So that'll happen in the fall. But uh, Mike and I talked about this briefly. If we anticipate a closure in December now, um, if there's somehow we could anticipate that this is going to be a challenge and we could talk about that here, how would that change these models Mike's talking about? And so we don't know, a ton of uncertainty around it, but I like this idea of in November as the steelhead management work develops, is there something we could do to these salmon fisheries to just maximize opportunity? And so just first off, thanks for the sort of quick thinking or smart thinking there. Mike, uh, when we talked about that, you you discussed uh, how, you know, if we were to close December, how would that really change a coho fishery? I know you may not have all that right in your back pocket, but just can you talk just generally about what kind of opportunity that would be? Is it a bag limit discussion like Travis is talking about? That would be about the only thing we could really do in season because we've got the areas open that... Um, have the best opportunity so yeah it would be going to a three fish bag um as opposed to two fish bag we did this in the past to be honest uh, i mean it looks good but very few people actually achieve that but you know maybe maybe some of, of you alan alan hollingsworth's uh could probably do that routinely but yeah that, that would be one of the options or pretty much the only option i can think of but if others have better suggestions, uh, certainly uh, we would listen. Yeah, and oh, Travis, yeah. maybe I'll ask that um, if you can, I know it's asking a lot, but if when we get to October, November, and the steelhead fisheries start to become polished, um, I'm hoping you can bring this topic up again. We're going to put it in our notes, and I just want to make sure folks know our our goal is to fish in December. We, we plan on fishing in December. Um, and every time we close in December, uh, it's pretty frustrating for us too. So, but I just really appreciate the sort of creative thinking here. Well, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm with you guys on that, you know, maximize the opportunity and, and get what we can get, what we have a chance to fish. Um, I, I'll definitely keep in touch. I keep in touch with Mike quite regularly, especially during, especially as we get closer to the seasons. Um, and kind of let him know what I'm seeing on the river. Uh, I, I can tell you this, that the past couple of years, especially last year, achieving that goal, Mike, of getting three in a day is, is actually pretty fairly easy to do in November. And the majority of the fish that I think I saw, I'd have to go back and look at my punch card, especially in the latter half of November, were all hatchery this year. Um, there definitely wasn't, there was no shortage of hatchery fish in November that, uh, that I ran into anyway. And I, I spent more time on the water this year than I have in a long time. So yeah, I'll definitely uh, bring it up again and um, we can talk about it if, if it's looking like we're gonna go 
go sideways on the steelhead again this year. So I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity and the time as well. Certainly appreciate it. And just kind of as a side note, um, survival of our hatchery coho uh, fairly sky, pretty much skyrocketed this last year. So um, I don't know what our hatchery folks were doing two years ago, but they did a great job. Yeah, it, uh, it was a, it was a great season last year. I mean, I didn't I due to some circumstances I didn't fish the salt water at all this year, so I went into the season with a blank punch card and and I was able to fill mine pretty easily on the Chehalis this year. So that was that was a bonus. So um, yeah, we'll be in we'll be in touch and hopefully we can get get something good going for this year. <clears throat> Thanks, Travis. Our next hand is from David. David, go ahead. Oh, a couple of things real quick. I don't fish steelhead anymore. I don't feel like freezing to death. Um, I'm old and cranky. <laughs> but uh, in December, there aren't that many steelhead. Uh, there used to be part of the run in, in the Chehalis. But we did the Chambers Creek thing, old game did. And uh, 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 it uh, pretty well took care of the front part of the run, okay, to be absolutely honest. So when you say December uh, steelhead or shut it down for them, that's probably the time of the year when steelhead are around at the least are, unless maybe summer run time, I guess. Uh, so, you know, when, uh, that the Lake Coho are in pretty bad shape uh, for whatever the reason is true. But the like the native run timing for the Satsa uh, back when I was much younger, it's around Turkey Day. There, that, that's where the native run timing before Bingham, uh, Ben Simpson did run compression when Stan Quinnell started it up and I think it was like 1950. So, you know, to shut December down for salmon fishermen for steelhead is pretty silly. The other side of the coin is that's what the tribes and the courts and the agency old game agreed on. And then you took the plants away and the production chains and stuff. So the tribes still fish steelhead in December and there ain't really that many steelhead there. Okay, so um, I don't know. But uh, the upper basin, the 300,000 mitigation or late time, uh, at Bingham, I think, puts out only 150,000 lates now, but that's 450,000 combined below the Satsup. And, sap. and so the upper basin hatchery fish are basically very late November, or mostly, and uh, depending what they do, and into December. And that's the, that's the fish that were chosen by the local community because they, by, if they use normal time coho, by the time they get up there where they can fish them, they're pretty much red. And so when the agency put those three release sites together, rather than just the Skookum Chuck, uh, Eight Creek, uh, I believe, uh, Skook, and then uh, on Alaska, uh, they, it was this, they used late time fish. So when you're looking at the fisheries for really, for co quality coho fishery, uh, it's late, late, it's, it's latter part of November and, uh, December for these guys. So one should always kind of remember the lower basin and the upper basin are just like day and night different. Okay. I mean, the Satsup and, and the Wainuchi are nothing like the Skookum Chuck, let alone the, the, the forks of the Chehalis and the Wacom. They're just much different rivers in the way they work. So you know, uh, the upper basin guys got a, a, a real, uh, they can get a, if you can't fish from a boat or uh, uh, you're going to shut it out for steelhead in December, you just really put the hammer to them. Uh, and and for, for saving steelhead, it's not that big. And then you got to realize you got the, the steelhead coming out of the scoop for mitt. I don't know the timing of them. So I'm just saying the gentleman had a really good point about late November and December, okay? That is, if you're, especially for Mark Fish, that's that's their time and it was designed that way. I mean, this is not an accident. Uh, the local community simply did not want normal time coho that will be redded up by them. So the, a late stock was chosen and that's why it was done. 
and uh, that, that's a, that's about that's all I got to say. I'm just but that the steelhead thing. You want to save steelhead and everything else, but doggone uh, those Lake Coho sometimes are in worse shape than the steelhead. And I don't know what the tribal's harvest figures show, where they call them incidental and don't report them. But frankly, the December fishery for the tribe is not a steelhead fishery anymore. The agency changed the way they run the fish and the hatcheries and stuff. And so, you know, uh, it's basically a salmon fishery under the guise of steelhead agreed to by courts when they put it in. And one should, can't go back and change it, but you should always operate understanding that uh, the upper basin is kind of vulnerable to decisions made that, that are basically based on what people see in the lower basin because it's totally different up there. Even the hatchery plants, everything else, it was designed differently. And I'll shut up now for a jabber on forever. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate your, your knowledge. Our next hand is from Francis. Francis, go ahead. Unmuting. Uh, kudos to Travis, I believe it was. I uh, like the idea if we're going to have a, an issue with December, which it sounds like the agency is receptive to try to keep that open as much as possible. But if, if it comes to a push to sub situation on steelhead conservation, the idea of uh, giving that uh, third coho before the December closure is very appealing to me as well. I would add just one caution, and I don't think it would be an issue. If we're going to have a third fish bonus, it ought to be a hatchery fish. So no more than two wild if you're going to do that. I don't think it'll be an issue. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge percentage of hatchery fish there. Um, chances are uh, someone, someone would fill that three fish bag. If, I mean, if they're that good, if they're Allen caliber. Uh, yeah, Hollingsworth, I'm giving you some props too. I know you're doing it. Uh, if someone's capable of putting three fish to the boat, odds are one and a half of them will be will be hatchery. Okay, so uh, the odds of getting the three fish bag are are pretty good. But let's let's not make it three wild ones. Let's 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 make sure we save a few for the gravel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Francis. Our next hand is from Travis. Travis, go ahead. Hey, Mike, I had one other question. I know there was some more monitoring, um, especially down in the lower river this year. Did, do you have, by chance happen to know how many, if any, steelhead were encountered uh, by the fish checkers this year in the lower main stem Chehalis? In the monitoring that we did in December, um, and I don't have the number or all of the data in front of me, but what I was told that there were no steelhead encountered. Okay. But I, I don't I don't have the numbers of how many people were interviewed, but that's just what I was told. Okay, yeah, that was just another question. And, and uh, I, I, I'm on the same page. If, if for some reason we got to go to a three fish limit, I think that fish should be hatchery as well. Um, I, I agree with that same suggestion as well. So uh, that's all I had. I just kind of wanted to see if, if there was any steelhead encountered. And I kind of, I kind of figured there wouldn't be. Um, because I was asking the fish checkers as well, and they were saying they weren't seeing any. So that just kind of reiterates the point. If you know, depending on how many people were checked, that we're not encountering steelhead uh, early. So thanks again, and uh, I'll listen to everybody else's comments. Yeah, and no, I'll just add on there. Thanks, Mike, for sharing that information. Um, we, I think, I can sort of lean on what Mike said that um, my understanding is zero wild steelhead were encountered during those fisheries. And that's what we're really trying to understand and just build information around if we design these salmon fisheries in particular places in December, uh, what is the impact to steelhead? Uh, so we, if folks remember, we built in these sort of impact limits uh, that met our policy guidelines uh, for these different periods of time. And it was really good to see that that couple week fishery we had in December um, was well within uh, where we hoped we would land. So 
Um, so that was really good news. And we hope to keep building on that. So that's the intention is to fish in December. I just want to make that really clear. And the more we build this information, the more we're funded to monitor those fisheries, I think we can just build strength around them uh, to show that we're creating opportunity and protecting these fish we care about. So thanks, Travis. And that was our last hand for right now. So just to remind uh, folks on the phone, if you want to raise your hand, it's star nine. Um, and for those on computer or app um, on their cell phone, there's a raise hand function at the bottom of your screen or reactions. And I see we have a hand from Bill. Bill, go ahead. Bill, you can go ahead and unmute. There you go. Uh, a lot, a lot, my name is Bill Osborne. I, I fish the Chehalis since 1968, and I've, uh, I've done my share of bank walking. Well, those days are behind me. I, I, I can't walk anymore, but I can fish out of my boat. The worst thing you did for me, and I'm 82 years old, you took away my ability to fish in December. Yeah, you said, yeah, I can use my boat, go to shore, fish from shore. Well, I'm here to tell you, there's people in this that have spoken tonight that are fishing my boat, and you know I can't get around anymore. I, if, you, if you wouldn't let me use my boat for jack fishing, my jack fishing days are over, and I love jack fishing. Uh, uh, I've caught coho into January, okay, hatchery coho. I fished out there between around the pump houses since way before the new plant was built, okay? And they've always had these late fish. And, and the thing that's always saved my butt is the weather's always been crappy and most people are steelhead fishermen around the first part of December, so they forget about salmon. I fish salmon. I'm a spoon fisherman. Alan Hollingsworth and I, we do a lot of fish in the same area. And when you take away my handicap sticker and say, Bill, you can't fish out of your boat, you've absolutely cut years off of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for, for your comments. Greatly appreciated. And certainly we will evaluate things as we move forward. Our next hand is from David. David, go ahead. Um, I just want to follow up there on something, what Bill said. Um, if you go to Friends Landing and look at the plaque there, you know, I helped get that going and then I went on to other things. But it was built about, it got the idea, it came from a guy named Billy, lost both legs to a landmine, and he couldn't fish. And that's where the handicap thing for Friends Landing came from. And uh, handicap access is something the agency re recognizes. It even makes special areas and stuff. But, you know, there's a difference between not being able to walk too much to not being able to walk at all. And so, and you got, you when you get into it, you get into ability and means. You know, if a guy's got a wife and three kids and makes 60 grand a year, he ain't dropping a hundred grand on a boat unless he's planning on getting divorced, okay? It's just the way the world works. And so when you guys make decisions, I would really urge you to think about the ones who don't have the money to live on a river like I do, or buy a boat like Doc has, or so they're limited. They're limited to walking down to a bank or riding in a boat with somebody to fish. And I realize it's not a monstrous part of our population, but doggone it, we seemed like uh, the closure last year you did uh, for flows. Uh, 
we have a difference of view on it and stuff because I've been around them, the Satsup especially. But the people that got impacted the greatest by it were the one with the least means, okay? The people that just have a rod by a license and go fishing. The handicapped people that can get a boat and ride with somebody with the boat and fish, even if they can get around a little bit. But Bill, he ain't bull, bullshit, forgive my language. He has to use a walker and he can still get that damn boat in the river and get out there and go fishing. Now, you, there, need, there needs to be some concern for those with the least ability and the least means to fish. And you can't loop, you can't just group all of us together because they are not in the same boat that we are. Okay, Doc, he can go fish wherever he wants. I can too. I can go to Alaska, I can go to Mexico. We do whatever we please. Others can't. And when you make decisions that affect the others can't more than the rest of us, that's just wrong. And you need to factor that in heavily when you make your decisions. Okay, I'll shut up again. And that was our last hand for right now. Um, just a reminder, uh, star nine for the folks on the phone. I'm not seeing any hands, Mike. I just see the two next to me. Dave's hand is back up. <laughs> Dave, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, in a conversation, Mike, you uh, indicated because people are, were uh, about Spring Chinook and stuff. And uh, uh, I asked you if you knew the exploitation rate in the ocean, you didn't. But the other thing, would, would you want about a two minute run on why we don't have a Spring Chinook hatchery so people would know once for all? Uh, yeah, and and I guess maybe I'll use that as maybe some some closing comments as we move forward. And lastly, you see somebody stick up their hands uh, as I slowly close the meeting down. Um, I don't know the full history of Spring Chinook. I, I know historically there was conversation about rebuilding or using, creating a, a hatchery stock, but um, it, it's a small population as are all of the Spring Chinook along the coast of Washington. And producing a hatchery fish from a wild stock means you're gonna mine some of those fish and, and small populations may not be able to handle the hatchery uh, production. So, so that might be part of it. And, and you mentioned something about where are these fish being exploited pre-terminally. Uh, because there aren't hatchery programs with code of wire tag data, we, we don't have a great idea where they go. We can presume that they, they're following uh, Paul Chinook around, but we're, we're not sure. So <clears throat> hopefully that, that covers some of it. Um, you know, with smaller populations, it's just difficult to, to maintain a, a hatchery production. Um, so I, I hope that brings to light a little bit of... of that issue. Um, and, and as we move forward, um, we have the the window of taking suggestions that are still open. Um, we, we've got a couple more weeks here to fine tune all of the uh, uh, proposals and, and get modeling done. So please continue to use the website to submit uh, proposals. We prefer them in, in writing in an email. Uh, that way we have a copy of them. So um, yeah, if, if you think of something between now and in the next meeting, next Thursday, please send us that email um, in the places provided on the screen there and uh, uh, we can get those modeled. <clears throat> so um, with that, I really appreciate uh, you guys coming on. Uh, I know Zoom isn't the favorite for a lot of folks out there, but it's it's what we have and what we can get done. Um, and again, I appreciate the time that you took uh, to sit down with us in this little teeny box up here uh, and, and chat with us about Grace Harbor Fisheries. So uh, with that said, and if there isn't any more comments, um, I will
bid you a good night and we'll look forward to talking with you guys, I guess, uh, a week from Thursday. It looks like everybody have a good night. Good night.